I'd like to say be comfortable, please, during, during the talk. Um, uh, if it's uh, nicer for you to recline, uh, feel free to do that. I know sometimes in our, in our retreats, we, um, we actually have a sort of situation where we have this very nice adobe uh, meditation hall here in Santa Fe, you know, made out of adobe, the, uh, the, you know, the, essentially the earth. Actually, it was built out of um, the, uh, the, the, the earth was dug right out of the ground where the, where the meditation hall is, is built. Uh, this is going back uh, 35 years. I wasn't here, here then. Uh, but the, um, in the hall, you know, when we're doing a talk, uh, sometimes people just uh, sort of lie on the, the mats and use the, you know, the little round meditation cushions, zafus that are very common. You know, you can stack them in a comfortable way for supporting the head. And it can be a very nice way to lie around listening to a talk. So if anybody feels like uh, doing that in the comfort of their home, obviously feel free to, and I hope you just would anyway. Um, so I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to launch into a talk now. And I want to, I thought what might be interesting for you to hear about is just a sort of a reflection on a view of practice of the different sort of components and arenas in which practice can be so relevant and so helpful that are in a way addressing, as I see it, slightly different dimensions of our growth and of our expansion, our, our, our opening up into more of our potential in different ways. And I feel that there are different dimensions of growth that are pertinent in this practice. I might say that this is uh, not something new. It's been recognized for a long time in the Buddhist tradition. Um, and in, um, in Chinese Buddhism, uh, Chan or Zen, you know, way back in the, in the sixth, seventh centuries, they thought that there were four kinds of practice, meaning essentially four, yeah, arenas of growth that practice could be, uh, could help with. And the first, uh, and actually, actually, before I go into that, I want to just let you know that, you know, basically I'm a Zen teacher and a mindfulness teacher, because those are the things I'm most deeply trained in. Um, but lately, what I've, what I've started to do is um, teach retreats that I've called original love uh, retreats. And I really want to sort of, basically what I'm going to be telling you about is what those are like in a sense or where, that, where they've come from, where that teaching approach has come from. And why I see, personally, I see love as the most critical, important thing in practice. That's what I've come to feel. But it's different kinds of love. It's love on different levels or dimensions that address these different kinds of growth. So, so yeah, this, this is a, I'm going to just share a little sort of way of thinking, a sort of scheme for thinking about different areas that practice so profoundly helps us with it. You'll, you'll recognize probably at least two or three of them, I think, anyway, maybe all, all four, but with this maybe slightly different perspective. So the, so, so the first, and this is going right back to, you know, one of these early Chan Zen notions about practice, that the first kind of practice is mindfulness. It's learning to come home to this moment. And so we can, you know, even just right now do that, you know, that here we are, uh, hearing a voice, I'm, I'm speaking, we're all listening, I'm hearing it too. We're in rooms, most of us, you know, just noticing where this body is, 
what it's perceiving through sight and sound and sensation, how we're doing internally, what's our mind state like, yeah. are we comfortable, are we comfortable physically, are we comfortable on an emotional level, you know, uh, it's uh, common to be comfortable and it's common not to be because, you know, situations arise in life and uh, that, that are challenging in different degrees. And, um, and as we, those of us who practice have come to understand, practice can be absolutely critical in helping us um, cope with the difficulties that naturally arise in life, particularly by retraining our nervous systems. And of course, Rick is brilliant on this, you know, in, in, in much of his work has been uh, understanding how meditation practice can retrain the nervous system and actually giving all kinds of pointers and tips and methods um, that I, I think he's come to himself that, you know, surely grow out of his uh, deep practice and the traditions he's trained in, but there are also innovations of his that are quite brilliant, I feel. Um, I won't mention them in particular because you know them all, I'm sure, but I've found a number of them very helpful myself. So coming home to now and here, in the body, the body is sort of really the key to inhabit our bodies. This is where, this is really the alternative to being lost in thought, to come back into the body with its experiences, including sense experience. So there's much to say, but that's kind of first arena that we need to develop. Then the second, um, and actually maybe I'll just add that one key point there for me personally is that that arena, the first one, in the end, it seems to be mostly about self-love. Uh, that's not always a popular phrase for us. You know, we think, we might think, you know, there's something sort of self-indulgent or selfish about self-love. I don't agree. And the way I experience it is actually, um, it seems to be the flavor of self-love that I know best, I think, or as I commonly experience it myself, is actually more like a gratitude for my existence. That when the self-love switch switches on, it's a very positive thing. And it's not selfish. It's a, it's a openness to receiving the wonder of being given this life and feeling grateful for it and even slightly humbled by it because it's, it's such a, you know, infinitely precious thing to have life. And the fact that we have it and we can be aware of it is even more wonderful in a sense that we can realize we are being given this opportunity of living. That's how I feel self-love is experienced actually. Not a sort of um, a selfish thing, really, but a, an appreciative thing. That seems to be, as I experience it and share it, you know, a key component of this first arena zone of growth, mindfulness. Somehow, for me, that's what it's about. Second zone, arena of growth, I call support meaning opening to the many, many kinds of support. Now, maybe we think this is kind of obvious, but actually, if we start to tune into it that we can do while sitting, in you know, a most basic level, you know, 
every single breath is not just a kind of support, an absolutely essential support, an utterly necessary support. I mean, each breath is given to us. And if it doesn't happen, that's the end of our life. Our life begins with a breath, an inhale, and it ends with an exhale. As anyone who's been around the dying, in the process of dying, will know that's finally what happens, is the exhale that is not followed by an inhale. Um, how aware am I commonly that my life hangs by a thread, the thread of breath? I consider that support, meaning it sustains my life. So developing the attitude that um, you see, the, 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 the first arena of practice, mindfulness, is, I think, rightly, very much about self. It's sort of managing, coming home to self in new ways, and, 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 and rightly so. But this second zone is more like, well, wait a minute, There's not, it's not just about self this practice my very existence is infinitely dependent i just mentioned breath if you start thinking about this it just ramifies it goes further and further and further how just how totally dependent we are that this i mean in so many different ways of course all the other elements you can think them through you know water earth warmth we don't survive very long without any one of them and but what about how come we're here you know we, we sort of think it's very intuitive to feel sort of sort of you know it's my life but i mean what about my parents who made me you know is it really mine this life it's a gift actually you know i mean uh, not, not to say that I don't have agency and choice. I believe we do, actually. I mean, we also have, uh, uh, I mean, we, that, that side of it. How do we um, orient and make decisions and choose positively and wholesomely? But the very fact that we're here at all is dependent on just so many things. And it's salutary for us to be more aware of that. It's very easy to kind of just forget it. But actually, the benefits of opening to it and opening to the, ne the, the right gratitude that comes with that, it all helps us grow. It helps us um, know our place better and... Uh, increase our sense of actually being in some ways very loved from kind of outside supported and loved in i mean not even talking about the many people in our lives who may love us and let's hope you know <laughs> and um and uh, that we're blessed to to know and be able to interact with relate with um, now, in terms of traditional practice, there's formulations of, of this kind of thing. There's something called the three treasures in Buddhism, which are known as Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. And they're all forms of support. The first, really, you could translate as meditating. But, you know, yes, we do that, but we're shown how. It's come down, this practice of being still and attending to the breath and other things it's you know again we didn't make it up it's 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 been gifted to us and then some amount of guidance in practice that too the teachings and you know the cumulative wisdom that's 
come down over the ages in practice, where it's beneficiaries, that's support, community, fellowship of, of practitioners. I mean, I, I, I don't know whether any of you could feel, I, I hope some of you could feel how marvelous it is to sit as we were doing just now you know, all these people around the world together in stillness. It's, it's like its own little sort of smooth lake or something. I don't know how you felt it, but maybe, you know, if you didn't feel very much, maybe t tune into it next week and just feel the, what, what's being given to us by being able to sit together. And of course, we're each contributing to that as well. So this sort of cycle of support is just amazing. Actually, in, 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 in Japanese Zen, they talk about, um, the, the, they have these two words, tariki and jiriki. And tariki, but by the way, I don't speak Japanese. I just know a few words. Um, tariki means self-power, meaning it's our own energy that makes something happen. And Again, that might be more pertinent to that first arena, you know, and then jiriki means other power, meaning energy being given to us from sort of outside of us, sustaining us and helping us and guiding us and supporting us. This second zone, opening to that. Um, it's got more to it, but I haven't got time to, to go in sort of too deeply, but let me just say, if the first zone is kind of about the self, I feel this second zone is more about the soul. So what on earth is the soul? That's a whole subject unto itself. But for me, it's certainly not some immortal entity within us. Not at all, not at all. I don't mean that. I mean more sort of deeper, somehow deeper dimensions of self where we're, we're feeling a broader picture. We're feeling more of a, deeper purpose may come to us and some sense of a, a, a strong uh, impulse to, to, to grow in, in a way that's not always easy to articulate, but we sense that seems to be ways of getting at what the word soul might mean, because I don't mean it as some immortal thing, no. But the sort of there are there are a number of you know well-known um, uh, psychologists uh, often called like transpersonal or depth psychologists, it's often they're Jungian actually, who have written about the soul in this kind of way, sort of deeper sense of self somehow, um, you know, and it loves beauty and it loves the infinite, it loves big landscapes. And it loves art and poetry and dance and music and all these, you know, these sort of somehow some slightly different sense of ourselves that's nourished by those kinds of things. That's very loose terminology here, what I mean by the soul. Then the third arena, getting to that. Now, this, this will be familiar to you guys for sure, because, you know, Rick references it actually. It's about getting into states of deep absorption. And I've heard Rick mention the jhana states, which is a, a, the jhanas are a sort of scheme of states of ever deepening absorption. Basically, they're very beautiful, fulfilling, peaceful, calm, joyful states of mind that we can find through practice. And when they sort of switch on, or any one of them switches on, by the way, they can collectively be known as samadhi. Samadhi is, a, is really a sort of generic word for states of absorption. Often it's translated as concentration, but that really doesn't catch it in English because for us, concentration typically means kind of sustaining focus on something. But this isn't really what, what, that, what this is like. It's, it's, it's one of my teachers said it's concentering. It's like coming together into one whole, centered. It's, it's actually um, 
actually the the etymology of samadhi is something like holding together so i've been told um sometimes it's translated as unification of mind or one pointedness i don't find that quite so helpful but but unification a sense of a wholeness that and in that wholeness it's like the whole of our experience the whole of our sense experience the whole sensorium having this sense of becoming one one thing one experience that's sort of suffused with different flavors can be great calm great peace great delight great joy but characteristics here that it's fulfilling we 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 feel wow we just don't need anything else and it's wonderful to find that that in being still without any external inputs you know none of the normal things we might reach to to feed ourselves whether it's the phone or the fridge you know not at all needed tv netflix well no, nothing's needed no music nothing's needed in order for us to find ourselves in a deeply sort of rich and utterly non-demanding state of mind it's a beautiful thing to find and it's very helpful for us because it's teaching us actually that we may need less to find that we can be happy with less is a healthy lesson for us and that's you know that's that's a great thing and you know it's got there's a lot more to it but let me just sort of uh, wrap it up there for the third zone arena of growth that practice tends to and then then we hit this tricky fourth one um and what that is is this wild wild land this utterly untamable, uncultivatable, in a sense, unreachable wild land of awakening. Awakening is something else again. I want to speak to that a little bit now. Let me just uh, check. I think, I think we're okay for time. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, you know what I thought I'd do is read to you um, an account um, of, a, of a powerful awakening experience that happened to a, 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 a businessman, actually, who was, a, well, he, he ran a hospital. He was a chief administrator of a hospital and uh, in the mid 20th century, who's a, who's a, a former teacher in the Zen uh, school that I'm part of called Sambo Zen. Yamada Koen is his name. And he, um, <clears throat> he'd been meditating for seven or eight years um, when this experience happened to him. And actually, maybe just before I read it, I, I ought to just sort of preface a little, preface it a little bit by saying, um, this word awakening you know it's it's core and key to the whole buddhist project because buddha the title given to shakyamuni siddhartha gotama um, by the tradition you know buddha it just means awakened um, I mean, maybe I shouldn't say just. It means awakened. That's the literal meaning of Buddha. And um, what what is that? I mean, it's parsed out and understood in different ways and different different um, different traditions outside of Buddhism. Buddhism will talk about awakening and 
and um, many, many arenas in life sort of may use the word. And um, in the context of meditation practice and this, this especially sort of Buddhist meditation practice, which is broadly what, you know, I'm in and I probably you guys to some extent are as well, um, even if it's less emphasized. But, you know, in that context, it, it, does, it does mean something quite remarkable. It means a radical shift in how we experience things that's, that's utterly wonderful. It's an extraordinarily liberating experience. It's a sudden shift. And the, the key ingredient is that our sense of self, our sense of who we are, suddenly changes. It's as if there's been a knot tied in the middle of me, and suddenly that knot is undone. And I find that I belong to everything, that I'm part of everything that rather than being a separate entity moving through a world from which I am separate, rather than that, I'm part of everything. And it's an incredible thing to discover. And it comes on, always the shift seems to be sudden. There can be a lot of preparatory training or and you know and meditating and going into those samadhi states those absorption states is probably the closest thing to preparation for it but there is no getting to it it comes by itself the part of us that would want to get to it is the very part that unravels unties it dissolves. Actually, you know what? I'm not going to read this thing because time won't allow me to right now. I think better than I'll just, if you don't mind, I'll just keep sort of uh, trying to talk about it a little bit to convey something of it. So the point is that when all the way through our practice in all those first three zones, arenas of development, of growth, all immensely valuable and and we can't leave them out and we need to keep returning to them and they remain part of our practice. But they're all, in a sense, on one side, kind of. And then on the other side, there's this thing awakening. And the difference between those two sides, if I can put it like this, the key difference is that in those first three, there's still clearly you know, a, a person, a me, who is doing the practice. When awakening happens, in the experience of awakening, there isn't me. Now, before you think, well, well that sounds terrible, that sounds ha ha very hazardous and I don't want to lose me and all that. Don't worry about that. Don't worry about that. That's not, that's not, it's, it's okay. It's okay. We don't lose anything. You know, we, I'm talking about in the actual experience, awakening happens as an experience and in it, we see that we are inseparable from all. It's the, the reality of sort of our experience, really, is that in, it sounds like a cliche, but it's all one. And it isn't a cliche when you experience it. It's astonishing to find that while I've been living, you know, sort of intrinsically probably a bit anxious, contracted into this sense of me when that by whatever means and whatever sort of magic and wonder and for fortune 
it and and practice it releases it just releases and there's this seamless whole it's it's the most kind of benevolent beneficent experience some some people actually think it's a kind of a counterpart to to trauma because it's 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 an overwhelmingly positive experience and that it can be very healing of trauma and um that it can like ptsd it actually can have an equivalent um long range afterglow and that's true it can um um now but having said that um so so maybe i've given you just some sort of a, a suggestion of of what this awakening thing is like now i call it okay, here, here's a here's a a, a, a final point that i i, I want to make on it actually in zen that kind of experience is traditionally is known as kensho that's the word kensho uh, some of you might know the word satori that's been in the cult in the zeitgeist and the culture for, for a while it's similar in meaning sometimes they mean the same thing and sometimes satori means something deeper than kensho but no matter kensho means seeing original nature that's roughly how it translates original nature meaning that our sense of self somehow drops releases itself and then we see this other sort of dimension of who we are in which we are belong we belong to everything and where everything is joined in one kind of reality. Now, um, what I, and so original nature is the translation, seeing original nature. And I'm actually, because the, the way it feels is really like dropping into a, a boundless love, I'm calling it these days original love. And what I think is so wonderful about it is that the more we train and the more we practice, the more we can come to see that it, it, can, be, it can become more apparent that it's always here. And as that happens, we realize that actually it's present in all those areas of practice too. It's not actually that I mean, because, because this awakening thing is, is a bit random, it's unpredictable, it's, you know, we never kind of quite know if it'll happen, let alone when, you know. And, um, but if we know that it's a possibility, somehow it, it, it may help if, we're, if we've got a framing of practice that includes it. it. It may help it to happen. I mean, not that we should be pursuing it, of course not. But the fact is actually that to know that it's present anyway all along, because of course it is, it's not like, it's, you know, we're, we're seeing something that's already been here. Um, but to know that it's, you know, every time in these other areas of practice, we get that flavor of love, I feel that's it already showing itself. And then I think it's, I feel really that I'm, it's, it's sort of like being a, a piece of driftwood on the ocean. You know, we start out with our practice where we're at the surface and every wave is lifting us up and dropping us down and we're, we're up and down and we're in the, the hurly burly of life and, you know, the, the gusted around by, by desire and hate and, and, you know, pleasure and pain and, name and gain and success and failure and you know gain and loss and in the we're, we're in the midst of all the, the the turbulence and but gradually we get a little bit more waterlogged if we're practicing we start to sink a bit 
the, the sea is a little calmer just under the surface. We're in our, we dropped into the body, into our mindfulness practice. You know, maybe we get a little more waterlogged and we, we drop a little deeper still and start sort of getting into the soul's territory, you know. And then deeper still, more waterlogged. And so we're in the, the, the vast stillness of absorption states. So beautiful much less sense of self actually the sense of self is quieter more like flow states you know where we're you know, in some in deeply en engrossed engaged in some activity and we sort of forget ourselves and it seems to happen effortlessly and it's rich and rewarding and time seems to stand still all of that aspects of absorption states of samadhi and then finally, you know, we, we, we maybe, it's like we disintegrate that, that driftwood is so waterlogged, it disintegrates and we find we're just the ocean. And that's what we've been all along, you know? And, and now if, if you're thinking, well, how can you sort of function if you're everything? Don't worry, it happens. It happens perfectly. It happens perfectly. And we can, we can still function freely like a self. We can be a self, I mean, we're not going to lose it. <laughs> We're not going to lose it so easily. You know, it comes back. It, it's more that we just get a, we start because we've seen through it and, and really seen that it's been a, an illusion in a certain way. It's a mirage. It is actually truly a mirage. It hasn't been with us the way we thought all along. It hasn't actually been real the way we thought it was. It's not that we're not sort of real, that there isn't a person here with body, mind, and heart. Not that, but the sense of self that we took it to be isn't really what it has been. And it's so liberating to know that, and it doesn't impair our functionality. But anyway, maybe um, it's time I stopped so we can allow, you know, a little time for any yeah any questions um i'm just i'm just just before i so i just want to check that i sort of uh concluded that point i was saying about the piece of driftwood sinking getting deeper and deeper and then dissolving was just to say the main point there i think is that if in that metaphor we could say the original love as i'm calling it is the ocean then it's been there all along it's just that we let more of it in through successive uh, sort of uh, releasings, letting go, lettings go, letting go deeper, more, going, settling deeper, releasing more in our practice. As we do that, we let it in more and more and more until finally there's the, it, it, there's, there's, there's no difference anymore between us and it. And that is a great, great, great blessing. And so, yeah, that's what I wanted to really share with you tonight. Um, so please, um, anybody got any um, comments or questions? I'd be thrilled to, I mean, I don't know that I can actually answer very Henry, Henry, I think uh, Jill has a question from before. So let's check in with her. Um, if you fine, can, um, fine, fine, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, I was reading your book today, and I was, I just love it. Um, I didn't finish though yet, but I, um, my con what I thought was my my take is that Zen is so profoundly unstructured that you need a lot of support. I mean, that would you say that you need to like a lot of like retreats? and even becoming a monk or something in order to really, you know, get a good practice going, um, you know, to be able to get to the point, like for that sort of thing to happen. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Well, let me, let me see if, how I can address that. I would say firstly, the question, is it profoundly unstructured? It probably, mm, it you just breathe, you know, you just breathe. And you count and that's all you do <laughs> yes it can be like that actually to be honest i'm not teaching it that way 
I'm teaching four foundations of mindfulness um, because I think it is helpful to have more structure than just breath. So, so, so I'm maybe a little sort of a, not the ideal test case, but <laughs> personally, I think it's because and, and, my own uh, the path of training that I went through prior to Zen, I'd already done some more uh, structured practice actually as well in Vipassana. So I knew, um, I felt all along that uh, I was using four foundations of mindfulness in my sitting. And I, I think it's invaluable. Having said that, that's, there is, so that's one little difference in, in, in the way I teach. Um, but in the traditional context where it is basically breath, and then at a certain point you might get given a koan, which I didn't get onto tonight. I, I, I could do another time, but there are these inscrutable little sayings that can be really um, uh, galvanizing and fertilizing of, of, of our experience in, in meditation. But anyway, there's structure in, hmm, in other ways, actually, I think it, I think it's fair to say there is structure in other ways. That, for example, there's more emphasis on posture. Now that might seem not a lot of help, but it actually can be if you've got a. a, a it's mostly about the spine, you know. But if you've got a, a a reference point in the way you're aligned that you can keep coming back to, that can be very helpful. Um, there's very clear cut, like we sit for 25 minutes, we walk for 25 minutes, we sit for 25 minutes, we walk for 25 minutes. So there's sort of structure in that. Um, I mean, there are ways that there is structure. It's just different. What, one big difference, probably the biggest difference then is that there's not so much guidance in meditation. I mean, like what I did with, with, with tonight, you know, I do that in the Zendo, but not in every sit. You know, if we, it, I'll do it maybe a little bit throughout the day and so longer amounts, more like we had tonight would be maybe, maybe only sort of three sits through, through a whole day. This is on a retreat, you know. So that, that yeah, that's a significant difference. And um I'm unusual probably even in doing that, actually. You know, I'm, I'm already a little bit of a hybrid sort of lapsed, eclectic sort of guy. <laughs> I'm not real sort of hardcore. So anyway, should we, should we take another question? Thank you. Thank you very much, Jill. Great. I think next up would be Rick Kruger. So Rick, if you could unmute. Um, Hi, Henry. Hi. Thank you so much for this evening. This has just been, you know, a, just, just a delightful experience. I hope I can take some of it with me for at least a few moments after tonight's session. I wanted to ask you, um, because I've been thinking about uh, the benefits of, of uh, psychological counseling and therapy, and, and one of the things that, that gets talked about in, in therapy, uh, there's all kinds of different forms of psychotherapy. I've actually just been watching couples therapy on, on Showtime, and um, the psychoanalyst uh, talks a lot about truth and coming to terms with, with truth, which in the way I think about it, and this is what I wanted to ask you is, what role does the falling away of delusion play in, in awakening and, and maybe also samadhi? <laughs> I mean, I think they're two very different things, samadhi and awakening. They're obviously related to each other. But I had a little bit of an experience of samadhi tonight during tonight's meditation. And it felt to me like I was just coming, I was just... Um, I guess experiencing everything the way it is without trying to color it or anything. So I just, I guess, kind of a roundabout question, but what role does coming to terms with what is true in your life play in, 
oh, in, um, in, yeah. in practice, I guess. That's, that's a very beautiful question. Thank you. Um, I mean, I think on some level, I mean, this may sound like a really radical thing to say, but I think on some level, one of the beautiful things about tasting this, this experience of awakening is that we can't help but feel we've seen something true. Mm. And by that, I guess I mean more true than the way we normally experience things. Mm. And that is uh, sometimes called its noetic quality. Mm. And it is, it is remarkable. I mean, and by the way, I was emphasizing one flavor of awakening when I was talking tonight, the oneness, the unitariness, but there are other flavors. There's, um, her flavors is a rather kind of soft word for it because it can be very powerful. I mean, these, you know, in the Buddhist tradition, the actually the, the you know, the, 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 the word that's most associated with it is shunyata, which means emptiness. And it's called that for a reason. And there are many ways that it's parsed out, but a, a baseline, the real hard truth of, of shunyata, and we can experience this, is nothing. And, but in, and, 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 you know, that literally sort of things fall away and they're not replaced. They're, they just fall away. And for that to happen in certain contexts, it might not be a good, helpful thing. But if it happens in the context of supported practice, it's a vast blessing because we know that somehow what's apparent then, which is, which is, which is an absence somehow, is true. And it's wonderful because it's where everything meets and it's what everything seems to come from somehow. So it's, even though it's empty, it's infinitely fertile, infinitely Powerful generous. At the same time. Sorry, could you repeat that please? Powerful experience of, of, of fullness. Indeed. It, yes, yes. And, 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 and I was just, I, I'm, I was, I don't want to lose track of your question. It was about truth that somehow even that, what is so sort of forceful and helpful in that kind of experience is, is that even there we know it's somehow true. It's true. And so, but you know, one of the things that I'm trying to really uh, sort of uh, convey these days is that actually all these different sort of, you know, levels of, of experience, including the most sort of ordinary daily state of mind and, and state of affairs, they're all valuable and they all need our tender care and our, and so <clears throat> it's not really that we would sort of want to privilege, you know, that kind of a, uh, Seeing that emptiness, you know, we could say, well, it's true, it's true. It is in some way even more true, but it, it should push us back to love our lives even more. You know, you see what I mean? And, and occupy our lives kind of thing even more, not make us check out from life. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Yes, well, uh, thank you. Thank you for. You want to take another question, Henry? Well, I wanted to check in with you, Tom. I mean, it's. I'm just looking at the time right now and seeing it's past eight, uh, nine. Uh, what is it? Uh, Seven thirty Pacific. I, I mean, could... I think we could take another five or ten minutes for uh, another okay. question or two. Okay, let's let's do another one. And, yeah. Yeah. and uh, next will be Jack. Okay. Unmute yourself, Jack. There we go. Yes, I did. Okay. Uh, as you were, uh, you know, in the talk, 
towards the end, I was thinking, I began to recollect some, you know, books I uh, read a long time ago by uh, Eric Fromm. And, uh, you know, we talked about the sense of separateness th that we have, and then the union. And I remember he was talking about how there's that need to deal with that suffering. And there are, remember him talking about how there are certain ways, loving ways, of developing the capacity to love, you know, and uh, being fully human. And I remember him talking about the way that uh, there are some, mentioned how there were some regressive ways to deal with that separateness, uh, which can be actually be hate based. Uh, and uh, I'm wondering if you'd comment on that. <clears throat> for sure let me let me see thank you very much for for that question beautiful um it seems very wise to me and i would probably right away i'd say i mean our our work in our mindfulness practice is definitely isn't it around i mean for me it still is around tending suffering being kind to ourselves especially around our suffering. And um, it can be, I mean, ironically, it can be that when we're suffering, um, we, we go into um, resistance to it. It's quite common that we, we feel this, I should not be feeling this way you know, on some level, you know, and that only amplifies it. That would be, you know, in Buddhist terms, the second arrow, you know, which is the resistance to the pain we're already having, you know, and, and I mean, <clears throat> I didn't know where the, where Eric Fromm was going was sort of pertinent to, you know, experience of unitariness or union if he was sort of seeing that as some sort of regressive state or something, I wouldn't agree with that, actually. I think all these different levels of our experience have their place. The only thing is that we want to be careful that we are tending all of them. There's a risk of spiritual bypassing, so-called, you know, that if, if people are having deep experiences in meditation, they can get quite theoretically they could get quite addictive that may happen but actually more common i think is just simply people i think this was called out way back in the 80s by john wellwood you know who coined this term spiritual bypassing that he was seeing people practicing hard and sort of pursuing their spiritual lives and meanwhile things are falling apart at home you know, or their job is falling apart, or their marriage is falling apart, that, that they're not tending. And in, in my scheme, that would be sort of ignoring their first zone. We I don't think we ever get a pass on probably any of those zones where they all need our attention. And it becomes ever easier to give them attention, hopefully through, through the growth and maturation that practice, if wisely pursued, in a multi-dimensional way can bring. So I think partly what I'm trying to say, and I'm not sure that Jack, that I'm, this is where you were going, but, but, but I do feel there's something I'd like to say is that I don't think awakening experience is, a, is, is, is rightly viewed as a way of sort of checking out from all the other stuff. Not at all. I, I see it as a, as a kind of, you know, mosaic. We, we, we're multi-dimensional and we, and we need still to keep growing in all areas. So I don't know if that's some kind of an answer. Um, yeah, it is. The other thing is that Eric Crumb does talk about, he writes about different religious experiences, including, uh, you know, Zen. So he very much, uh, you know, sees the value of, uh, you know, of meditation, uh, you know, self. And, and so, yeah, uh, so he, he understood the importance of uh, you know, spiritual, uh, uh, you know, development. Oh, that's good. Good to hear. Yes. 
Yeah, thank you. Well, I think, um, what, do you, what do you think, Tom? It, I don't want to keep everybody sort of too late, but sh should we see if there's one more or should we just end it now? How do you, how do you? Actually, Tom, you're muted. I, uh, Rachel okay. had a question and uh, maybe we can uh, put the mic to her. Go ahead, Rachel. Yeah, thank you so much. I re really appreciate what you discussed. Um, you did mention PTSD, and I was wondering if you could dis discuss the relationship between meditation and PTSD. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. I mean, I, I'm not an expert, but I think there are there are different approaches whereby meditation can be pertinent. I mean, what I, I've done some somatic experiencing, somatic therapy myself. Um, I had a lot of trauma, you know, from my childhood. Uh, chronic, you know, decades of of uh, chronic uh, affliction, skin affliction. I mentioned briefly earlier, and um, I think there's a place that I think there's a way actually that meditation can go kind of hand in glove with somatic therapy because we're developing our capacity to know body experience in meditation. But I think that. Um, you know, there may be a, there may be a risk of people with PTSD just jumping into meditation, and if it's if it's not in a context that's sort of trauma informed, um, perhaps it it could be unhelpful that they'll be they'll be overwhelmed by feelings they find. Um, I don't know. I'm sure there be might be others here who could speak more cogently to the subject. I would, I would be uh, on the whole hoping, I think, you know, the first thing would be, yeah, someone in, uh, if, there's, if there's access to a person who's informed about trauma, um, when somebody with PTSD is beginning to meditate, that would probably be a wise thing. I think for sure it could be healing in, in the long term, but it would need the right kind of support.